What is up, Cougar Nation? It's a Cougar Tracks, Cougar Sports Saturday podcast from BYU Football Media Day. Mitch Harper, Matt Biamonte. Matt, it's been an eventful day so far. We're going to get after it with some radio interviews coming up here shortly, but uh, some initial takeaways from BYU Football Media Day. Man, I thought the, the biggest one for me so far came in the state of the program, and you did a nice piece that's up on KSLSports.com, but Tom Homo really went after NIL and the transfer portal. And I thought that was really noteworthy because BYU, if you remember back to the early days of NIL's Bill Bar deal, they were all in. They, they were one of the first to really embrace it and jump on board. But it has spiraled since then. And Tom Homo was very critical of the, the lack of rules. It's not black and white. Uh, you know, It's kind of a free-for-all a little bit in the portal. And it was just begging for some rules and some structure in the NIL and transfer portal world. And and I agree with him. We've talked about this at length yeah. on Cougar Sports Saturday, but he's he hit the nail on the head. He definitely did. And he did unintentionally, I think, announce that there was nine conference games in the Big 12. I was like, this new BYU in the Big 12 era, they're making the announcements first. They're making the announcements first. Not waiting for anyone. So nine conference games. That was not worthy. I caught that too. I, I leaned over to Dell. I was like, did he <laughs> yeah. just drop? No, like, did I miss anything? Was this like previously? Announced? <laughs> I know. I was like, look at Tom going for it, making the announcement. Uh, so that was uh, a newsy item, if you will. Not no update on the bowl system for BYU in 2022, but I think the expectation is probably like the Hawaii Bowl. You know, something like a nice location, and that's not anything bad. It's going to be an ESPN event game, uh, but uh, I think. Don't expect anything great, BYU fans. Even if you're in, say, 11-1 and one, and there's only one at-large bid this year, keep that in mind in the New Year's Six because of how the Bulls are in the semifinals and then you got all the tie-ins with the Pac-12, the Big Ten, the ACC, there's not going to be many spots. So expect the lackluster postseason. But, hey, there's only one year left of that. And this one year in the regular season, there's a lot of optimism from these coaches. Yeah, I, we had a chance to catch up with a lot of the coaches for the past couple hours. Uh, one thing that really stuck out to me from a conversation with Coach Clark is the health of Isaac Rex. So uh, Coach Clark says that Isaac Rex is ahead of schedule, but they're going to be really cautious with him. He'll be on a – this is a, a term so often used. I don't know how it applies to football, Mitch, but pitch count in <laughs> uh, in fall camp. So, that, you know, it will be day-to-day with Isaac Rex. But, you know, in the spring, I thought it was a long shot that he would have a role. And now it's really starting to feel like if all goes well in fall camp, that Isaac Rex will be uh, firmly in the mix in that tight end room. Yeah, feel free to share your questions on KSL Sports Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, wherever you're watching. Uh, you can chime in. We can answer your questions. Uh, there's always some personnel news and notes when it comes from, from media day. We got the first depth chart of the offseason. This one was a little bit different because last year it was a post-spring. They didn't include the newcomers because people were, were saying, Where's Pokonakua? Is he is he gone now? Like, no, no, no. It was just a post-spring. This one actually included some newcomers, and there was a lot of new faces at the secondary room. Uh, but some of the, the missing names. I put together my list of some of the notable missing names. I kind of combed through every aspect of the roster, and here's where the names that I thought were noteworthy that were not on the roster. We're going to go just alphabetical order. Uh, Theo Dawson, linebacker, transfer from Wyoming. He wasn't there. Brock Gunderson, not part of the program anymore. He was a signee in the 2018 class. Luve Hilu, he might join in fall. I talked with Harvey Unga about that. Uh, still kind of to be determined there. If if not, Harvey wants him the gray shirt. He's a talented running back from Tooele, but uh, keep that in mind. Isaiah Heron, uh, could be uh, Kyle Ireland, our KSL Sports uh, digital producer, noted that Kalani, Kalani, Kyle, you can hop in here. Uh, he said Kalani said on Heron that he will be a medical retirement. Medical retirement and is getting his degree from BYU. Okay, getting a degree from BYU. Because I spoke with General Guilford about Heron, and uh, he didn't have a definitive answer. So there you go, Isaiah Heron medically retiring. Uh, a few other names here. I'll just run through some others. Uh, Keanu Saliapaga, uh, not going to probably be playing. Dylan Rollins, offensive lineman, Montana Player of the Year a couple years ago. Uh, he's moved on. And then uh, Isaiah Tupo, he's going to be joining in the fall as a gray shirt. And then Seth Willis as well. So some moving and shaking on the offensive line. And that's one of the reasons why a guy like Sione Vicoso came into the mix from Arizona State, who uh, Daryl Funk was very high on some of the conversations there. So that's kind of your personnel news and notes from BYU Football Media Day. And that I think that's some good context for the addition of the Vanderbilt transfer, Gabe uh, Judy Lowry. Yes. So, the, the, you know, what we thought was with a lot of depth of Heron, 
still depth is there, but with him out of the picture, there's going to be opportunities. Well, and, and General Guilford noted that the newcomers that are coming in, all the freshmen, first things first for them, they've got to be able to be uh, aggressive in man press. They got to be good at that. If they can't do that. They're not going to play. That, that's the first line of business for them if they want to have any chance of playing. Uh, another big storyline at Media Day is the quarterback spot, Jaron Hall. We've yet to talk with him. He spoke in the BYU TV state of the program address, but uh, I think we're both on the same page that Jaron Hall, he's going to have a huge year in 2022. I, I did think it was noteworthy uh, when Aaron Roderick was speaking in the state of the program that he says that physically he's in the best shape of his life. So he's really put the work in in the weight room uh, throughout the offseason, and he's going to need to prove that he can stay healthy if he wants to get to the NFL. And that's been a, a top priority. And I, I loved when Aaron Roderick joked. Uh, I, I can't remember the question, but it was asked him about Jaron. I was like, yeah, he's a good player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's definitely a very good player. And, you know, Aaron Roderick, speaking to him, he, he noted that uh, this is as deep of an offense as he's ever had in his coaching career. So that includes his time at Utah. Uh, so that's, I thought, was a noteworthy tidbit. I also asked A-Rod, too, about – you know, there's been so much talk this offseason about additional resources, getting more support staff. How is that actually helping him? And he kind of broke it down, itemized it and said, I'm no longer doing this. I'm no longer doing this. So this is now freeing up all my time to now uh, focus on, in, you know, creating game, creating plays and, and enhancing the playbook. I thought that was very interesting. Aaron Roderick breaking that down in such depth, because I think, again, it's all right. Now you got this analyst, you got this uh this uh, director of associate AD of this and this and that's like, what does this all mean? Well, they kind of broke it down and why it all matters. And, and BYU is operating like a big 12 program. And let me add to that. I had a good conversation with coach Clark about play calling and installation of plays. And he said that very rarely does a play work that wasn't installed in spring football. And I think to your point, more time to put that stuff in in spring football. And then he also noted at the beginning of fall camp, but he's like, very rarely do we script up a play at 1 a.m. on a Tuesday and it works on game day. And so now that there's some more time for the coaches to put in that work in the spring and in the off season, I just thought that was noteworthy that, hey, you know, it's like, and I, and I brought up the, the, the play against Houston in 2020 where I think we all kind of, at least I did, thought that that was a play they grabbed from the Chiefs and threw it in. Yep. No, that had been practiced all spring and all fall camp, never been called, and they were ready for it. But um, that is very interesting for Aaron Roderick. Yeah, defensive side, that's an area where I think a lot of Cougar fans are thinking, could it be the weakness? Uh, you know, I asked Elisa Tuiaki, what's going to change? And, you know, he was pretty candid about, but he's bullish on this defensive line, and he's – optimistic about what this group can be. He even said that there's some packages where they could have six defensive linemen in a play. Uh, they, he feels that they're deep. And I, you know what? I tend to agree with him in the fact that how much snap counts these guys have had. You pretty much bring everyone back except Lopale Tawa. I think it's just a question of, you know, you, had, you struggled against at times Georgia Southern. You struggled against UAB. What's going to look like against Baylor? What's it going to look like against Arkansas? Notre Dame, I can go real off the names. I think that's where, you know, they're going to have a chance to, to prove the doubters wrong. And um, But he's he's bullish on this defensive line. Tyler Batty, I think, is one of the stars of the group. Preston Halley's very excited about him. He was also very high on Fisher Jackson, my conversation with Preston Hadley. Uh, and that's no surprise. He's going to be in that OE spot where he could maybe fill the role that maybe Logan Fano uh, leaves behind after his ACL in spring. One thing I thought was was noteworthy too from Hadley for BOU fans is sacks are important. I know yeah. I know that's kind of come and gone throughout the time of Tuiaki, but he made it clear like they're not the end all be all, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to downplay the importance of sacks. That's that's word for word uh, what Preston Hadley said to me, and I think it does come down to in a lot of cases, do you have the talent? Do you have the players that can get to the quarterback? And this will be a huge year for guys like Tyler Batty to prove that few injury updates to uh, Jax Kafusi. He should be good to go for fall camp. We didn't see him in spring. Nice Mahe, uh, he should be good to go. Nice Mahe, uh, Lysa Tuiaki brought up a comparison of Stevie Tui Kolovatu, who played at Utah, then went to USC. He was a guy that fa faced injuries, was brought along slowly. Uh, Lysa drew some parallels there between Nisa and Stevie Tui Kolovatu. I thought that was noteworthy because he was an NFL draft pick, I want to say. 
uh, Stevie T was back in the day. Uh, Brooks Miley, he suffered an injury back in spring, not going to play this season. Uh, that's the expectation. That's why he was not on the 123-man roster that was released today. Uh, secondary, uh, pretty good spot. Uh, General Guilford, pretty excited about them. Uh, safety position. Uh, I think that's a spot where Emin Hanneman, he's atop the depth chart, and Malik Moore. Malik Moore, by the way, behind the scenes thing. So I'm talking with General Guilford, and did you see this, Malik Moore? He suddenly slips on the floor. There was some BYU TV like stunt. I thought he legitimately fell and he blew out some or he suffered some injury. You see Kalani to the side going, Malik, don't get hurt, don't get injured. And he just like slips on the floor. He was acting. It was all a stunt. But I'm like, that is the last thing you want to do is get that man injured because he's the best safety by a mile for BYU on the back end of that defense. Yeah, and I, I caught up with Ed Lamb. I, I can add a little context in the safety room, but he, he's starting to praise his Malik Moore. Last year at this time, he was fighting for playing time and wondering whether he's going to start. He is a definitive leader at safety. Behind him, though, Hanneman, Hanneman, Hanneman who you mentioned, and, and guys that were healthy, and they were healthy in spring. They were just held back for precautionary reasons. George Udo, yep. Micah Harper, there in the mix. Talon Alfrey, another guy who has recovered from an Achilles injury. He'll be in the mix as well. So uh, Chaz IU, to my uh, disappointment, has put on some weight and is going to be at the linebacker position. So I have to build off that. I, I talked with Kevin Clune about Chaz IU specifically, and yeah, it seems like he's going to be in a linebacker. He's like he could be a safe, but it's it's physically he's going to that linebacker spot. That's what we've been talking about all year uh, on Cougar Sports Saturday, which again you can listen to KSL News Radio noon to three. Every Saturday, we're going to have a bunch of interviews. throughout. So throughout the summer, you're not going to want to miss Cougar Sports Saturday. We're going to be catching up, and you'll hear a lot of this audio and sound and things like that. So a lot of coverage uh, coming to you from the KSL Sports Team, KSL News Radio, KSLSports.com, KSL The Zone, or KSL Sports The Zone, excuse me. So a lot of coverage coming to you from BYU Football Media Day. We're going to sign off real quick. We're going to go into the radio booth, maybe get a bite to eat. But there's the, some daylight donuts, as Dave McCann talked about. It's the same donuts since 2011. And uh, <laughs> so we're going to go get that. And then we'll, uh, we'll get some lunch, and then we'll talk to you soon here on kslsports.com. Look at that zoom in. You like that, folks? Look at that. <laughs>